Welcome to Sustainability Matters. I'm Tria Case. Today, we're looking at the fashion industry. It's fun to look sharp and buy a new outfit, but a garbage truckload of textiles is going to the landfill every second. The bottom line is the majority of our clothes eventually ends up in the trash. The fashion industry has an enormous environmental impact in its production, in its manufacturing, and in the transportation process. However, there are some visionaries shaping a greener future in fashion who are here to tell us about some eco-friendly and ethical practices. Let's start with an overview of the fashion industry's impacts from Andrew Falzone. Whether it's the runways of Fashion Week, window shopping in a discount store, or trying on the latest in trendy attire, if fashion is your passion, you might not realize that you could be contributing to global sustainability issues. Some of the problem has to do with consumption. According to a 2018 United Nations report, between 2000 and 2014, clothing production doubled with the average consumer buying 60% more garments, ushering in an era of fast fashion. That same report finds garments are now kept half as long, creating a vicious cycle of production and consumption that has fueled the fashion industry into a $2.5 trillion global juggernaut business. Denim is a pretty telling example of a sustainability issue when it comes to resource management, once a hallmark of the blue-collar lumberjacks, cowboys, and rail workers that won the American West, jeans are now a comfy clothing staple, and when it comes to making them, the process consumes a lot more resources than a simple cut and sew. It takes 10,000 liters of water just to grow the one kilogram of cotton needed to make a single pair of denim jeans. In comparison, it would take a single person 10 years to drink the same amount of water. The same UN report says that the fashion industry is one of the biggest sources of wastewater, accounting for 20% of global annual totals. The fashion industry also generates around 10% of annual global carbon emissions. That's more than all international flights and shipping combined. Additionally, synthetic fibers, when washed, can release contaminants like microplastics and microfibers into the environment. Regulation is one approach to fixing the problem, and here in New York State, the Fashion Sustainability and Social Accountability Act was proposed in 2021 to do just that. It would apply to apparel and footwear retailers operating in the state with global revenue of at least $100 million. The sustainability measures include disclosing at least 50% of all stages of their supply chain from raw materials to final production annual disclosures of adverse environmental impacts, and setting impact reduction goals. The bill also has social justice goals. This is a cotton plantation, but no, it's not in the American South. Instead, it's in the Xinjiang province of China, and this investigation from the BBC helped uncover suspected labor camps where Uyghurs are forced to work in unfair conditions. New York's Fashion Act would require the disclosure of high-risk suppliers located in regions like Xinjiang, known for forced labor. While the fate of the Fashion Act is debated in legislative committees in Albany, what can you do to reduce your impact? First, start by buying less. Do you really need the same sweater in five colors? You can also prioritize quality over quantity. Second, don't discard. Recycle or upcycle clothing by donating it or even trading it in at a thrift store like the Salvation Army or Buffalo Exchange. Third, shop eco-conscious brands that are using eco-friendly materials. Some major names like Zara and H&M say they're already moving in an eco-positive direction. And exciting new fabrics are coming to market, like Seawool, which is made from discarded oyster shells and polyethylene plastic bottles and claims to be as soft as more traditional merino wool, helping make a sustainable and fashionable future. I'm Andrew Falzone for Sustainability Matters. Thank you, Andrew. I have to say, I didn't realize how much plastic is found in my clothes and how much clothes contribute to our landfill. We have with us Madison Klein from the organization Fashion Revolution. 
and Denise Sutton from the Fashion Institute of Technology and CUNY's New York City College of Technology, City Tech, and Kat Roberts from Cornell University and City Tech as well. All of them are working towards building a more sustainable fashion industry. Welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all for coming here to be with us today. Madison, tell, me, uh, tell us a little bit about Fashion Revolution and what you're doing to change yeah. this industry. Yeah, so Fashion Revolution is a not-for-profit organization that was founded in 2013 by Carrie Summers and Ursula de Castro um, in the wake of the Rana Plaza collapse in Bangladesh. And, you know, we are one of the largest um, movements of fashion activism that's working to mobilize citizens, uh, brands, policymakers through advocacy, research, and education. And, you know, through that work, we're really just trying to, you know, help showcase how we need to be able to put um, people in the environment over profit and growth. So it's just a great community where we all get together monthly. We host events. We have Fashion Revolution Week every April. And we also, you know, work to kind of get the word out about sustainability and issues um, in the industry through our Fashion Transparency Index that's released once a year. Can you talk a little bit about that index? Yeah, so the Fashion Transparency Index really dives deeper into brand supply chains, taking a look at what they're doing right, um, what could be improved, uh, and it is a bit voluntary if the brands want to be a part of it or not. Um, and so it is very in-depth, um, but it is a wonderful resource for anyone that is interested. Denise and Kat, you're both on the education side of this work. How has education changed um, and are students starting to think more about sustainable fashion? I think some of the changes more recently revolve around uh, sustainability issues. For instance, the textbook I use for my intro to the fashion industry course. Um, in the new edition, they finally added a chapter on sustainability. And your organization is highlighted Amazing. in that yeah. chapter. <laughs> So, you know, before that, I would have to put together my own lesson plan on sustainability. So I think, um, you know, the publishers had to become aware that now this is an important issue. Our students need to know about what's going on in the fashion industry in terms of sustainability. And students are really worried about the state of the environment and what their future holds. And when the students go into the industry, Hopefully they realize um, that they will be able to make the changes that they want to see happen now. So hopefully we're also preparing them to go into an industry and make changes. Kat, you're, not only have you taught in this arena, but you're actually studying to yes. further your own education in this mm -hmm. arena. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I, I was really, um, I was a maker. I, I didn't see myself uh, going into academia at all, uh, but I did my master's here and I was pleasantly surprised um, that my advisor, really supportive of me sort of taking what I'd been doing in my apartment and these things I was thinking about and seeing how I could apply it to my research and studies. And so I started thinking about um, upcycling. So that I've continued um, in my dissertation and it's been it's been really exciting because to be honest I get um, pretty bummed out <laughs> about a lot of these topics you know there's a lot of bad news when we look at the amount of waste the chemicals uh, you mentioned the plastics but there's also a lot of creativity there's a lot of people um, even in just our community of New York there's so many people who are using their creativity and their know-how and they're not waiting for companies to catch up um, they're coming up with solutions that positively affect their own environments, the waste streams around here. When you say here, by the way, you mean the, the Graduate Center, the CUNY Grad Center? Um, I mean in New York City, but yeah, um, the Graduate Center for sure, uh, CUNY for sure. And to Denise's point about students, they're way ahead of us. Uh, they're all thinking about sustainability and they're all integrating it into um, how they're thinking about design, how they're thinking about what they're making. And so I really think it's incumbent upon the education system to move even faster. We're getting chapters, we're getting these things, but we need to do more because um, it's required in this moment and, and the students are, are really demanding it as well. So when you all look across this industry and you look at New York City, what are some of the challenges that, that folks are facing when they're trying to become more sustainable in terms of what they're designing or even what they're buying? 
the system needs to change. And so I know that there's a lot of design system thinking that is also in the works um, where we're looking at products not from a design standpoint as here's beautiful fabric, what are we going to create with it? But it's more about where is it going to end up in designing backwards, I feel like it's where we're kind of headed, but I think that it's not easy. It's mm -hmm. all of this, it's very challenging and it's a new way of working. Um, and there's a lot of in-depth you know, business systems and supply chains that have already existed for so long. And so to just come and abruptly change them, um, it's difficult, but it's necessary. Are there some solutions that uh, your organization is putting forward that you're seeing are working? Yeah, I mean, I think with Fashion Revolution, it's really um, learning to educate the consumer, um, you know, and I'm also a designer for Coachtopia, Coach's sub-brand, um, focusing on circular design and, you know, through adding in like an NFC chip into our garments, we're able to connect more with the consumer so that they understand the lifespan of their garment and also upcycling, you know, looking just at what can we do with the waste that already exists, with mm -hmm. clothing that already exists, and how can we keep it from you know, joining the landfill? Yeah, for the last two years, uh, our fashion students in their fashion show, all of the outfits are upcycled. Mm, so they definitely are ahead of yeah. so many other companies and organizations. Could you guys talk a little bit about what upcycling means? Do you want to sure. take that one? <laughs> uh, so it's basically um, transforming something that's already in existence. So recycling, it usually ends up in it's uh, downcycled. So whatever you do with it, that's probably the end of its, its life cycle is that outcome. But with upcycling, um, you're either creating something that's of equal or greater value. And I think that we also need to like expand the ideas around value and get it away from just monetary um, thinking about how it's important to you. So um, how, how are you gonna treasure this? <laughs> how are you gonna use this in a new and exciting way? As a historian, <laughs> I've actually seen <laughs> upcycling from uh, the 1930s and even before. Mm -hmm. So one kind of famous example is the feed sack, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, a sack that you would get your flour or cornmeal in. Um, and what uh, people were doing was repurposing that feed sack and turning it into clothing or household items like curtains or dish towels. And when the packaging companies discovered that consumers were upcycling their packages, they started to design their feed sacks in bright colors and in prints. And that was a marketing strategy, a really smart marketing strategy to get people to buy their brand because then they could collect enough yardage mm -hmm. of the same print for a dress. So people have upcycled in the past and if we could kind of continue that yeah. type of innovation, mm -hmm. that's what's really needed. Are there other uh, solutions that you're seeing the marketplace pick up? It, there's a lot happening with recycling too. And I think that it's, it's great to think it's, it can't be one thing or the other. It has to be all the things and it has to be now and just this focused attention. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times si there's a lot of siloing with sustainability mm -hmm. and it's hard to know um, what other people are doing. And so as much as we can get rid of that and all be talking to each other, mm -hmm even if you're not in fashion, even if you do something I don't know anything about, you might have like an amazing idea that sort of cracks the code of some things that we had been trying to figure out too. And, and even like um, the rental market, mm -hmm. not without its flaws, but really anything that you can keep from going into the landfill, um, being discarded, the secondhand market is great, but it also causes problems. So just being creative, um, swapping things out, yeah. as you mentioned lots of solutions. I, I know that students are definitely starting to think about this and mm -hmm. we've, we've spoken with, with a few of them. So why don't we uh, pause for a moment and take a student question. Hi, my name is Kira Scott. I attend Hunter College and my question was, how do you recognize greenwashing in a company's advertisements or um, their initiatives when they're talking about sustainability within their brand? probably should define greenwashing first. Um, Denise, you want to? Maybe? Sure. So greenwashing is misleading marketing on a supposedly environmentally friendly or sustainable product. And unfortunately, that term has been in the news a lot recently because some companies are misleading consumers with the way that they're marketing their product. So some of the things that you can do is really to read beyond the label 
to do your research and don't be fooled by some of the imagery that uh, companies and marketers will put on a product um, like a leaf, you know, to indicate that it's natural. And if a product is certified, to really understand who the certifier is and if they're legitimate. Um, why don't we take a, another student question? One question I would pose to sustainability fashion uh, experts would be, how do you make it so that big corporations such as Nike, Adidas, H&M, how do we hold them accountable for the practices of producing such fast fashion? We all know the conditions for workers are less than ideal and there's a lot of negligence and abuse going on. How do we pose policies and bills and bring them forth to lawmakers? How, how do we make a change when we have a voice and we need it to be heard? Let's talk a little bit about what fast fashion is. Yeah, yeah um, so fast fashion is a business model that's set up to get product to the market as quickly as possible, um, but it tends to usually be cheaply made um, in order to make it that fast, low price points, and the quality ends up not being as great. So there's you know, a lot of issues with that type of business model. Um, it's encouraging overconsumption, especially in this world with social media where everybody wants things quicker and faster and to have the latest products. And I do think that, you know, a lot of these big name brands that you would consider fast fashion like H&M and Zara and Shein are trying to implement some strategies because so many people are starting to question it. Brands really are trying to make these changes. It's just, it takes time, like I mentioned earlier, to really implement them into the system. Mm -hmm. So it's really, I think, kind of based on the consumer um, to look into their own shopping habits and if they want to shop you know, fast fashion brands, you know, sometimes it's necessary for people depending on their income, um, but shop less based off the trends, shop for something that you think you'll wear multiple times, something that, you know, you really love, um, or try to find it in the secondhand market. I think to the student's question of legislation and holding companies accountable, um, I do a lot of research on the beauty segment of fashion, and I know, for instance, that the European Union has banned around 2,400 harmful chemicals in cosmetics, whereas the United States has only banned around 11. So the United States has yeah. a long way to go to catch up to Europe, but I think that consumers can also encourage these changes by their spending habits, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So what you decide you're going to spend your money on and what you're going to support yeah. but also pushing for more regulation, mm -hmm. especially in the area of beauty where there is so little regulation. And clean beauty has been in the news a lot recently. And there have been a couple of class action lawsuits, one against Sephora and another against Target. There's no legal definition of clean beauty. Mm -hmm. so, or of sustainability to that. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot to be done around these kinds of legal issues and regulations. Um, and then just getting back to recycling, I would love to see a federal uh, law around recycling instead of just leaving it up to the state and municipalities. There is a bill that's in the works um, in New York that is trying to put um, the responsibility on the producer of textiles in order to figure out what happens to the waste. And so to the students' question too about what th can they do to try and help push this legislation, um, you know, Fashion Revolution and even organizations like Remake, they hold um, different days for advocacy where you can go up to Albany or even travel to DC and um, meet with the different members of legislation to help push um, to have some type of definition even around it, some yeah. type of law. At the bottom up, we can change our behaviors and maybe a little bit of top down, if mm -hmm. you will, try mm -hmm. to maybe right. push that change. Right. Let's take a, a moment. Um, our, our producer, Mike Gilliam, met with uh, a nonprofit called Fab Scrap. Uh, this organization is dedicated to collecting and repurposing excess fabric from the fashion industry. Let's take a look at what he found. One man's trash can certainly end up being another's treasure. And that is absolutely true when it comes to something called Fab Scrap. Fab Scrap is a New York City based nonprofit. We work with the fashion industry to redistribute and recycle their excess fabric. Jessica Schreiber is the founder of Fab Scrap. She says she got the idea when she was working in the offices of the New York City Department of Sanitation. Brands were reaching out asking what they could do with all of their 
fabric waste from the product development process that wasn't a garment. So not the shoes and handbags and accessories or apparel, but all of the waste material in creating those items. There really wasn't a place for them to get rid of their waste. So she came up with the idea for Fab Scrap and went and got funding in a truly millennial way. I was on season one of Project Runway Fashion Startup. Really? It was sort of like Project Runway's Shark Tank. Uh -huh. um, so I pitched to a panel of four investors in the fashion industry my new fashion recycling idea, and we came away with $60,000 to get started. That's great. One of the main ideas is to save all of this fabric that would clog landfills and wreak havoc on the environment. And we're talking a lot of fabric. So, I've been looking at this big pile that you have here, okay? <laughs> how much textile is this, first of all, and, and how would this affect the environment if we went to the landfill? Um, this is our big to-do pile. We still need to sort all of this. It's about 60,000 pounds of fabric, and keeping this amount of fabric from landfill has the CO2 reducing benefit of planting 6,000 trees. 6,000 trees? 6,000 trees, if we're able to keep all of this from landfill. Here's how it works. When a company signs up, they get two types of bags to put their scraps in. Black bags for scraps that have identifying patterns or logos that can't be recycled and must be shredded. And brown bags for fabric that can be recycled. When the bags are full, the company calls for a pickup. And all of that stuff is brought to a warehouse at the Brooklyn Army Terminal to be sorted. So the small pieces of fabric that aren't big enough to reuse um, get shredded, and this raw shredded material is called shoddy. And then shoddy gets used to create insulation for new buildings, carpet padding, mattress stuffing. It's used a lot in the automotive industry. The larger pieces end up either going to volunteers who get free fabric for working at Fab Scrap or are sold at thrift store rates. They also have leather, lace, trim, buttons, and other items used by fashion designers. Because Fab Scrap is a nonprofit, all of the money raised through sales and donations is funneled back into the organization to be used in their effort. Since Fab Scrap opened in 2016, they say they've saved 1.6 million pounds of materials from landfills. Both customers and brands have embraced the idea. We're working now with Marc Jacobs, Oscar de la Renta, J. Crew, Express, Theory, Lafayette 148, Eileen Fisher a lot of New York-based companies. Camille Tegel is director of reuse for Fab Scrap and a former designer. The crazy thing is that we receive yardage of fabric that is completely reusable, that was originally headed towards landfill. So even all of these rolls of fabric, um, these are all yardage, they just don't have the cardboard in them, but they're all available for people to shop and we just organize them in a way that it's easily approachable and not as intimidating as a pile of fabric. For me, if people can understand that things that were originally destined towards landfill can be reused and upcycled and kept into circulation and have an extended life, to me that's really important. I'm Mike Gilliam for Sustainability Matters. Thank you, Mike. This is a great example of, of what can be done. So um, let's continue talking a little bit about consumers. Um, what, what can consumers be doing to, to, to make this change? I think for me, a big thing that consumers can do is to really just ask themselves, who made my clothes? There's um, a history behind how it was made, multiple hands that have touched it throughout the supply chain, and just trying to understand that a little bit more and try to dive deeper into looking at um, where your clothing actually comes from. Well, when I talk to my students, I try to give them actionable items that you know they can do every day. So I say things like, um, don't wash your clothes as often, you know, because there are actually microplastics coming off of your clothes, getting into the water system, and we all have microplastics in our bodies now. Over the holidays, I cleaned out my closet a little bit and I was seeing uh, relatives from the West Coast and I was like, oh, this would be good for Kate or this would be good for my niece. So I, you know, gathered up a bunch of my clothes and then I, you know, we kind of had a swap meet, you know, over the holidays. There's so many small brands that have a small footprint. They're usually using materials that are local, so the supply chain is shorter. 
uh, they're much more open to be transparent about um, their process. Where are they getting these materials? Uh, who are they hiring? Um, there's really a lot of labor that goes into this. And as much as you can understand about that, you realize there's no way a shirt can ever cost $5. Uh, that is not mm -hmm. possible. So educating yourself, but then when you're able, you know, certainly finances come into this, mm -hmm. but we tend not to pay for labor when we pay for clothes in this country. So learning that these costs are not correct um, and trying to, even when it's difficult at first, um, changing our habits and supporting uh, brands that we really believe in, especially very creative ones, very transparent ones, and even better if it's in our community. Mm -hmm. Shop local, support the sustainable mm -hmm. fashion companies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Learn to kind of love all of the things that you already have and know that really in this day and age, I feel like we're constantly being marketed to as well. So I think it's a little bit of, you know, the work too of realizing, um, you know, that you don't need everything that's always out there. You can be content with the clothes that you already have. Absolutely. So looking forward, um, what do you see as, you know, coming our way in sustainable fashion in New York City and beyond? I think collaboration. Collaboration is really important. Big brands collaborating with small brands who have this incredible expertise. Um, they know what to do with these excess materials, with these waste materials, um, and really just more open conversations. Again, so much of this uh, is just veiled. It's hard to know what's going on. So as much as you know about what's going on, uh, you can ask more specific questions. Communication, mm -hmm. research, right. <laughs> investing in right. things we should. Thank you guys, thank you all for, for being here today and for sharing your expertise and for all that you're doing to make the world more sustainable. Really appreciate your time here. Thank and you. I'm, thank you. Yeah, thank this you was fun. So it was a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Please keep the conversation going and follow us or send us a message on social media. Thank you for watching and tune in next month when we will discuss sustainability requirements for public buildings, including CUNY.